Selamat berjumpa lagi. I'm Raisa Chintami of the Indonesia Channel in Jakarta, and this is your weekly look into the dynamic Southeast Asia region. ASEAN leaders met virtually for the 36th ASEAN Summit to end this month, with the coronavirus pandemic topping the agenda. The leaders called for a unified response to the health emergency to ensure a strong economic recovery. They discussed initiatives, including establishing an ASEAN COVID-19 response fund, setting up a reserve supply of medical supplies, and establishing standard procedures for epidemic response. Hội nghị ASEAN lần thứ 16 thành công, thống nhất rất cao để ra các tuyên bố chung của hội nghị. Một khu vực ASEAN an toàn, đoàn kết, gắn kết và chủ động thích ứng, đặc biệt là phòng ngừa dịch bệnh tốt, không để làn sóng thứ hai của Covid-19 trở lại khu vực này. Và thứ hai nữa, cùng đoàn kết để phát triển kinh tế, xã hội, để các nước có điều kiện phục hồi kinh tế, the summit had been scheduled for April in Da Nang, but was postponed and done virtually due to the pandemic. Countries in this region are beginning to loosen restrictions that shut down business and travel for more than three months. Malaysia is further easing restrictive measures to allow nearly all social, education and commercial activities to resume. Data suggests that the COVID-19 outbreak in this country is under control. Businesses and activities including barber shops, night markets, mobile food trucks and group gatherings were allowed to resume from June 10th. Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin said the country is expected to reach normalization after August 31st. Thailand lifted a nationwide night curfew that lasted for over two months on June 15th. This came after the country reported no new COVID-19 cases over 21 days. The lockdown relaxation of the country meant that 95% of business and leisure activities could reopen. In the Philippines, shopping malls reopened to allow in-person shopping as the government relaxed coronavirus restrictions in mid-May. But the malls have shortened their business hours, closing three hours earlier at 7 p.m. And in Singapore, students began to return to school on June 2nd, but polytechnic lectures and tutorials remain online, with students returning to campuses mainly for practical and lab sessions. On June 19th, Singapore allowed small gatherings and the reopening of businesses. Social distancing remains in place. A major court ruling in the Philippines is being described as trouble for democracy. A Manila court found award-winning journalist Maria Ressa and her former colleague Reynaldo Santos Jr. guilty of cyber libel on June 15th. Their news website Rappler ran a story in 2012 linking a wealthy business executive to a string of serious crimes. Supporters say the conviction is part of a government campaign to muzzle free speech. This after Rappler published stories critical to the anti-drug crusade of President Rodrigo Duterte. The ruling is being appealed, Ressa faces a fine and up to six years in prison. Malaysia's High Court will deliver its initial verdict on a former Prime Minister at the end of July. Najib Razak is accused of embezzling close to $10 million from the government's 1MDB fund. Defense attorneys insist Najib is a victim of an elaborate scam, saying the former leader believed the money in his account was from Middle East. Eastern donors. His lead counsel also claimed Najib had no knowledge of the cash transfers. If found guilty, Najib faces up to 35 years in prison and heavy fines. Also in Malaysia, 269 Rohingya refugees were detained off the northern resort island of Langkawi. 53 of them jumped off a boat and tried to swim ashore before being caught. The others were detained on board. Authorities had intended to turn the boat away, but they say it had been purposely damaged with an engine beyond repair. 
there. Since May, nearly 400 people have attempted to enter the country illegally. Farmers in Malaysia are going digital to restore the flow of fresh produce from the fields to consumers during the COVID-19 pandemic. ASEAN Today's Karina Tasha reports. The Cameron Highlands is Malaysia's main source of vegetables. Operations here were severely disrupted after the sudden imposition of coronavirus restrictions in mid-March. Limitations were imposed on interstate movements and restaurants were limited to takeaway. That hurt supply and demand chains. Cameron Highland uh, is producing close to uh, 800 metric tons uh, daily of vegetable during the lockdown of MCO. Only 10% can, uh, can get out from, uh, from Cameron Highland. E-commerce platforms like Lazada reverse the situation by delivering products directly from farms to consumers. That episode actually exposed um, the supply chain of fresh produce uh, to many weaknesses that they've been facing. But this time, the pandemic as well as the lockdown just brought it to the forefront. Lazada was so quickly to grab the opportunity to build up what would have taken years to build um, uh, in terms of public intervention. Um, it was proven highly efficient. Wong had already created an online distribution platform for farmers before the pandemic struck, which played a pivotal role in restoring the flow of fresh produce. The lockdown just speed things up so rapidly and so rampantly. Farmer adapted quite fast. The packaging and how we handle the vegetable is quite crucial to ensure the good quality uh, can be delivered to the end consumer side. We are still learning though. As in most cases, cutting out the middleman benefits both sides. In this case, it proved to be critical. Karina Tasha for ASEAN Today. More ASEAN Today is coming up shortly. China's issuance of a white paper on COVID-19. Experts in the hot seat, next. You're watching ASEAN Today. I'm Raisa Chintami in Jakarta. ASEAN leaders say everyone is helped by a report issued by China on June 8th on fighting COVID-19. It was in Wuhan, China, where the new virus saw its first outbreak. The regional and global reaction were immediate. It's very comprehensive and I think it's going to be extremely useful for uh, countries that are now, you know, still battling the uh, outbreak. There's a lot of, you know, uh, changes of ideas and changes of knowledge and best practices. So we can see a lot of, you know, benefit from, 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 from the informations there. And uh, what is even more important is, you know, how you are, you know, addressing, you know, uh, the uh, outbreak, you know, at that, you know, very detailed level. So I, I think it could be very useful. And also now that the ASEAN member states are preparing to reopen the economy, so I think some of the uh, answers they can find in the uh, white paper for sure. China coronavirus response clearly highlights the challenges China faces in fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Conducting medical, virological research and vaccine development is not only China's responsibility, it's also what the international community should do. China took the lead in providing unreserved assistance in order to enable all countries and peoples to respond to the challenge of the epidemic in a united manner. What China did was to restrict the transmission of a respiratory virus, which is not something that we thought could be possible. And respiratory viruses are very hard to, to stop because people are breathing them out as they're talking to each other and sometimes you don't even know that you're sick and so it's very easy to pass the infection and so what china did was actually remarkable the four-part white paper ends with the goal of creating a global community of health more asean today is coming up shortly we will head to thailand that's where families are in limbo after travel rules were extended
This is ASEAN Today coming to you from Jakarta. Families in Thailand are facing hardships of several kind due to the coronavirus travel ban. ASEAN Today's Fauzul Azim has the story. Local women with foreign spouses stuck outside the country are facing tough financial times as the travel ban caused a plunge of household incomes. Breadwinners can't come home to work and be with their families. In Bangkok, Patama Nongwa is raising her two children alone. Her husband, Finn Banas, needed to take care of his sick mother, had boarded a plane to his home in the United Kingdom before the travel ban was imposed. Nongwa is finding herself under great strain as her husband's mother is ill. At the same, her family faces great economic difficulty. <laughs> Kanyana Champophysis is looking after her newborn baby alone at home. Her husband Barry Munch headed off to Omen for work in March, expressing disappointment after missing the chance to witness the birth of his son. It's the most important day of my life. I wanted to be there for it. Um, that wasn't to be, so I'm, I'm just eagerly waiting now to see when, when, I, when I can go back to Taiwan. Kanyanat also hopes to be reunited with her husband soon. Mooch is getting used to daily video calls with his family, which he says has been the closest thing he has to be with his newborn son and partner. More than 90% of people around the world are currently in countries with coronavirus travel ban. To curb the spread of the pandemic, Thailand's government banned all incoming passenger flights on April 4th and has extended the ban for several times. For these families, all they can do is wait and hope. For Uzul Azim, for ASEAN Today. Here are several events on the ASEAN calendar. Foodies are preparing for the Singapore Food Festival from July 10th to the 26th. The spotlight is on Sarawak where the Borneo Jazz Festival will be held from July 17th to the 19th. And the Asian Literacy Conference is scheduled from July 30th to August 1st at the Manila Hotel in the Philippines. Thailand reopened their top tourist destinations after the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. ASEAN Today's Aisha Nadira reports. Thailand's Grand Palace is Bangkok's crown jewel. It's open again after strict health control measures. The tourist hotspot had closed on March 22nd, but it's taking a while to get the visitors back. The palace's main gate is usually packed with visitors from all over the world. On this day, it was deserted, with only a handful of souvenir shops open for business. <laughs> Chen is one of the many tour guides jobless for more than two months due to the outbreak. The government provided direct payments of more than 5,000 baht or $159 to each affected tour guide, but that was only for three months. With the threat of the COVID-19 still a concern, officials say the Grand Palace and other attractions will need some time before the tourists come back. In normal times, there were 20 to 30,000 people visiting the palace every day. For now, most visitors are locals, with vendors waiting for the return of international arrivals. Aisha Nadira for ASEAN Today. We like hearing from you throughout the ASEAN region and the world. All of our episodes are posted on YouTube, so check us out there if you can't find us on your local TV channel. Then let us know what you're thinking about or what you want to see on the program. Email us at ASEANtodayTV at gmail.com, post something on our Facebook page, or tweet us at, at ASEANtodayTV. Thailand is using the latest technology to help keep shoppers virus-free. The easing of restrictions means finding new ways to stay safe. Robots with 5G and AI technologies are now in place at several malls in the capital. They are helping welcome and guide returning customers. <laughs> Robots like Lisa are one way to cut down on the possible human spread of germs. And that's ASEAN Today for this week. I'm Raisa Chintami of the Indonesia Channel in Jakarta. 
Terima kasih. Please, join us again next time.